It's a sort of a little bit of setting the stage. You know, Arlington is a small place, um, and lots of people have to move to and through us in order for commerce to happen. Um, our land use is predicated on the long-held principle that we concentrate development on a small percentage of our land, as you see about 11% of our land, in order to preserve our single-family neighborhoods. And because of that concentration and the pro close proximity of neighborhoods, the issue of how we manage car storage, both short-term and long-term, is critical to maintaining an appropriate balance between these two kinds of uses. Um, and as is ensuring that we have a, ro a robust multimodal approach for people to get around within the county. So cars are obviously a piece of it, but so is robust transit, so is walking, so is biking. Our tax split is approximately 50% comes off commercial, 50% comes off residential. That's been really important to our success over time. And that means that as we look at mixed use and we promote mixed use, we need to pay attention to both sides working, continuing to work well. So our homes need to hold their value, and our commercial properties need to work well and generate the value so that, um, so that everybody kind of gets what they need in order for the community to keep um, being robust and moving along. Now, we use a number of policies and regulations to, related to parking to sort of manage, and in particular, we're talking about buildings that go into our site plan process. So a buy right building <clears throat> doesn't have to pay the same kind of attention to the parking issues. Um, they have to meet what's in the ordinance, but unless they come into our site plan process, they can't negotiate something different from what's in the ordinance. So what you're looking at is predominantly related to what people, uh, what's in play <clears throat> in the site plan process. So our general land use plan, our adopted sector plans, our area plans, our zoning ordinance all give clues, um, as does the 4.1, um, uh, to what we expect and what we think will work. We also have a very um, elaborate, and that is not meant in a pejorative way, um, master transportation plan with six or seven elements that are interconnected and interrelated. Um, and the, not, no one element is particularly long. This is the, the demand management one, and, and this is the one on parking. You do have to look at them, though, together to understand the dynamic. Um, these are the two that I think are most relevant. You might think it should only be about parking, but in, indeed the trade-offs are around TDM and, and management issues between I'm providing you the space and oh well you don't have to have the space. So um, these really are important for you to look at their, their clues in there um, about what we were thinking about at the time that we adopted them. Now the, the one thing I would say is that they have goals and they have strategies and they have measures of success the way they're structured. The goals are pretty clear the measures of success are pretty clear. We adopted a number of strategies at the time that we did these. They're not meant to be exhaustive, and they're not meant to be, you know, check every box, dot every I, cross every T. There's room for flexibility in the strategies because there are lots of ways to solve problems. And so as you look at these, I think they're cues and clues about what the board thought was important at the time. But some of these are now five or six years old, things have been learned, new situations arise, and you should not feel constrained by those strategies, I guess is really the point that I'm trying to make. Um, thinking a little bit about principles related to parking, and, and um, I think fundamentally the board believes that parking is a commodity, and that pricing helps us to make sure that the commodity is being well used. We have to balance the interests, as I said, between the neighborhoods, the residents, the, the people who live here, and the people who come and work here, and the people who own buildings. And it, it's a little bit like Goldilocks, right? You, you have to do the right amount. Too much leads to certain kinds of behaviors that may not be good for the community. Too little leads to other kinds of behaviors. So the trick of it is to get to something that seems like it will work for the vast majority um, of users. And we certainly have long held a, um, the belief that shared parking can really work, that 
office tenants during the day and residential tenants at night um, is, a, is a reasonable way for a community to organize itself. I will say to you that um, we are finding, though, uh, and this is more my personal observation, most of you probably know I live a block off the RV corridor, I live a block from the Clarendon Metro, and I've lived there for more than 30 years. And as we develop um, what I think of as 18-hour districts, which is really what Clarendon is, and as these, um, the, there's more overlap in the users, so, you know, we've got a, we ramp up at night for the dinner crowd, and the restaurants, there's 70 restaurants between um, uh, Northside Social and the sandwich shop that's just past Whole Foods. 70 restaurants. They are busy during the day, and they're very busy at night. Well, there's a whole set of people that come to work to run those restaurants and serve the food and stuff, and they often arrive before the, the office tenants leave. And so shared parking presents some particular challenges when you have a robust restaurant district next to a busy residential area with lots of office and how you think about that parking. So what those challenges are when you have those overlapping time frames that don't necessarily work for straight up shared parking is, is an, you know, Sherlington's got some of those same elements with less transportation built in. Um, currently, I would say that, the, that, that our whole policy revolves around the, a belief that it is the responsibility of the developers to provide sufficient parking space for vehicles that are expected at the building. Um, and so in the planning phase, figuring out that number is really important because that drives a lot of the economics of the project because parking is, is expensive. We also believe that developers should contribute to encouraging their tenants to use alternative modes of transportation. So if you look at our 4.1, our site plan process, there are multiple conditions about the kinds of transportation demand management that we expect. There are dollars attached per, you know, well, two cents <laughs> per square foot to support our commuter services program and to support our Arlington transportation partners who help um, building owners and tenants build out that TDM process. Um, more and more, again, thinking back about these 18-hour neighborhoods, <coughs> the issue of does do, do the multimodal things that work during rush hour work when you're off rush? So if you have good bus transportation that's feeding the subways during the morning and the evening rushes, but that isn't there at, at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock when those restaurants close, that causes you to have to think differently about how people come to that area off when transit presents itself. And that's, so is there a role for people who build buildings in those sectors that's different? Because we know we're going to need parking in a different manner than if we're only talking about residential and um, commercial. Um, we do believe that parking can take into consideration excess parking that might exist in an adjacent building um, or be available um, in, a, in a neighborhood or in a parking garage that's previously built. We also believe that um, when you look at a whole district, if there are places where you're preserving old buildings that don't have parking, that you need to factor that into how the whole district works as well. And again, Clarence is a great example of that where the north side of Wilson Boulevard is mostly old buildings without much parking. And then we putting in new things that are considerably larger. How does the need for parking in, for those old buildings factor into how we think about parking for the new? Um, uh, and, you know, sort of without speaking, we, uh, you know, this is kind of a duh thing, but if we build too much parking, the price is too low, there's too much incentive for people to drive, and then we end up with gridlock, um, which none of us want. And the neighborhoods worry if we don't build enough parking that somehow it will spill then into the neighborhood, you know, and be, be an issue both during the day and at night. And, um, and the response that we have because of the way our policies are constructed is that if, if neighborhoods can show that 
you know, they're 75% parked up, mostly with people who don't live in the area, they can come in for some managed parking on their street, which may or may not help the overall situation in the district. It probably will solve the problem for the neighbors about parking in front of their house, but it may exacerbate or like the balloon bulge out in some other place. And so, again, getting that right is really important. So I think I'll stop there.